thanks for joining us. If you want to just start off and tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you grew up and what your childhood was like. Uh, sure. Yeah, well, uh, to be here. Um, I grew up in Wales, uh, in the UK, in, a, in, a, in the countryside. Um, so up on a hill with a few other kids, uh, but not so many. So it was a little remote, but with, with two sisters and two loving parents and, uh, and a little, little old farmhouse. Um, and yeah, that was, that was basically my childhood. Very, you know, happy, um, just kind of on BMXs around the, around the countryside. Um, I wasn't one of those kids that was like, you know, I had Star Wars figures, but I wasn't like sort of grouping them together and filming them with like a Super 8 or anything like that, you know, like uh, Spielberg's childhood or anything. Um, I, I was, you know, into art. And then I think at a certain point, art turned into photography and then photography into moving image and then moving image at university. And then, yeah, and then ended up coming out, having shot some, you know, having so shot some graduation films, wanting to be a cinematographer. So, um, but that that's a very accelerated view through, you know, uh, through my childhood. But yeah, it, it was, um, yeah, growing up in the countryside, that was me. What kind of things were you like watching as a, like a young child that got you into like interested in going to like film school? Was it film school you say, or just like a college where you- You know, there's only a few film schools in the in the UK that you can really come out and, and, uh, and say, oh, I'm gonna be a DP or a director or something, you know, and the national film and television school being the most most prominent. Uh, it was a degree in, I mean, we had 16 mil filmmaking, you know, so it was a filmmaking degree in essence. It was called media production, but it was, you know, it allowed us to really concentrate on narrative filmmaking. So that, that was cool. Um, uh, yeah. And then in terms of films that I, um, you know, in terms of, of films that I was interested in, I think, you know, um, I remember, I remember, having a keen interest in horror and things that were gory. And um, in, I remember American Werewolf in London was on television and, I, and it was on at 11 o'clock at night and I was quite young at the time. And I think I fell asleep and insisted that my dad woke me. And so he woke me to, uh, to you know, when this movie was on at 11 o'clock at night or something. And I sat and watched it and was terrified. Uh, I remember being really enthralled and uh, I guess even then having this real, recognizing that that film was a really interesting and successful marriage of comedy and uh, and horror, you know, uh, both horrific and very funny. So, you know, that that's not always so easy to pull off, you know, in, in the horror genre. Um, but I also really like that, you know, when I was a kid, we only had really had three TV channels and then we had channel four. So channel four came, you know, um, in the eighties, that was, uh, you know, that was our fourth channel. And, um, there was a, there was a, you know, they, they, they commissioned pretty, or, or, or if they didn't commission, they certainly showed pretty kind of esoteric things. And there was, um, there was a, a director called Elliot Bristow, who I think now lives in Bristol in the UK. And, um, Anyway, he 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 filmed these things called road dreams that were kind of these super eight trips across America. And he just sort of set them to music. So there was no dialogue. It was just imagery, you know, it's shot from cars and things. And I remember my dad showing those to me. They made an impression. And then I was really into REM and I was really kind of in, into their music videos. And there were lots of kind of impressionistic, arty kind of like shots of hands out of car windows being filmed and it was all dreamlike and you know and i loved that and then um i remember the very first film i shot was a film called ballast in mississippi you know and i i always really wanted i was very drawn to like american iconography and landscape and and i remember filming in cars for this movie ballast and it and it all suddenly fell into place and when i suddenly realized oh yeah that's that's where that was from or that was you know so a lot of sort of like i was very interested in this idea of bridging the gap between documentary and fiction you know um and i still am you know where where fiction films feel part documentary and and where performances feel caught and quite naturalistic and more available light than 
beautifully lit crafted films you know and so that's kind of where my sensibilities lie still i think uh even though i've explored other ways of shooting shooting fiction um but yeah that's i think that sums it up once you're in film school like what kind of projects were you working on like little short films and and did you have like um a chance to kind of explore a little bit there and then from film school how did you kind of transition into like working as a dp or did it take a while to kind of find find your feet and find the different jobs when i went to film school i wanted to direct i think because i didn't know any better really i didn't know a great deal about the other roles you know within 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 the industry and then so i did direct uh quite an experimental sort of again experimental impressionistic short film um but i also shot i i shot uh shorts i sort of assisted other as i was progressing through university i i camera assisted on graduation films and then when it came to our third year i then was able to shoot those films you know um and i think the bit the, the the great thing that i'll always say about film school there were two things one was um you know as opposed to a kind of vocational qualification or it's like just working your way up in the industry the, the great thing i think was that it it allowed you to put film through a camera you know or digital as it probably is now and have a light meter and tell a story um not altogether completely successfully but allowed you the opportunity to do that and then from then on you could you you know it allowed you to fall in love with it i suppose you know rather than just be a tech you know not just a technician but rather you know it, it allowed you to to explore what being a filmmaker could be as opposed to um just learning your craft in a in a you know in an apprenticeship kind of way i suppose and then the second thing was it 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 introduced me to people um that i ended up going you know film you know filmmaker you know directors and producers that i ended up um working with and and ultimately shooting uh my second feature for you know so it was that and then i think thirdly it allowed me to just think about film film theory was very important rather than it just all being about the technical i'm, I'm still very much interested in storytelling and having discussions about storytelling as opposed to the the technical i can hold my own in a conversation about technical but it f you know t-stops and lenses are not they're not what excite me you know about about working in the industry when you talk to a director about filming a project like what's the initial kind of conversation like do you talk about like how do you want it to feel or how do you want it to look or do you have references from other films or is that kind of like how you're trying to interpret like the story like what they're talking about how do you kind of approach a project well yeah it's a good, it's a good question it's a big question but um Okay, so, uh, you know, mainly, even though I work in commercials, mainly I work in fiction, I've chosen to work in fiction, uh, as opposed to documentary or even television, really, I, I, you know, I, I, I have shot television, but film, feature film, is, shooting feature films is really my first love. Um, it's interesting, I've realized over time that there are some, there are many ways to sort of approach a film and to make a film. And, and also that, um, you know, also, also, I've realized that some DPs and directors come come at it with an incredibly uh, strong sense of how something should be shot. You know, uh, or the story should be told, almost dogmatic. Some sometimes to the point of sort of uh, not really letting anything else in. You know, into the equation, and and that's not a, that's not about you know that way certainly works i mean if you take i don't know how i've never worked with david fincher but if you take fincher or you know looking at hitchcock and people like that i think they had a very clear way of that their film was going to feel and then the process of making the film was just almost putting a to b to c to d you know assembling their vision i don't think i work that way i i think um i think i Firstly, like to be inspired by what the director has to say about it. Um, I mean, obviously, first off, you read the script, and then if you like the script, one's agent, um, most of the time, your agent will set up a meeting with the director, and then you'll discuss it. And and I mean, 
of course, it's essential to bring ideas to the table, but I also want to, you know, visual ideas, storytelling ideas, but I want to know what the director's take on it is as well. I'm just not, I'm not the person, even though I can bring strong ideas to the table, I, I do believe in this idea of kind of finding the aesthetic and exploring things. Um, and for me, I think talking about it now, that that's also the idea of documentary and fiction. So I, I like letting things in i like letting the accidental in i like the world that one is building in this collaborative medium i like i like that to surprise me and to inform me and locations to inform me or what the light is doing to inform me you know there's a, a cinematographer um christopher doyle who i like very much who shot a lot of one car way movies um you know happy together and in the mood for love and beautiful and he did you know I, I probably, I, he does have this quote where he says, you know, um, in the West, you say, uh, here's the frame, how do I fill it, you know, and it's impositional, it's about control. And in Asian cinema, you say, here's the world, how do I frame it, you know, and I think that's a really succinct way of illustrating my point, you know, because it's, 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 it's not about being so loose, that you don't know what you're doing, and nobody being in control. I mean, that is a dreadful way to make a film i think I, you know it's directionless and it ends up with filmmaking by committee but my point is it's very important for me to be responsive to the to what is you know occurring and and because otherwise you can often look at go into a film looking at a piece of paper about what it is you decided you were going to do storyboarding or shot listing and you're completely missing what is happening in front of you you know and it's just the way i choose to approach it. It's what excites me. So did that kind of c come from like a, like documentary style, like uh, observing the world, like um, in terms of like, how did you come up with that kind of process? It's just like more organic. You feel like you're, you're kind of capturing the world rather than like manufacturing something? Yeah, it's, that's again, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I personally think he goes all the way back to like growing up in Wales. I think it grows, I think it goes all the way back to that. I can't necessarily, I can't necessarily pin everything down and articulate every single nuance of that, but it's an emotion. It's what sort of turns me on. It's what fires me, it's what intrigues me. It's what I'm looking for, you know? And I was looking for those things even before I got into making film, if that's not a too vague a way of describing it. It's it's an emotion, it's a feeling, it's like, and I know it when it happens. Um, and I think it was either informed by those things that I mentioned earlier, those kind of like slightly documentary court moments that, for some reason for me seemed to be a way of articulating humanity or what it was like to be a to, to grow up to be alive um you know so it's it for me it kind of feeds into that thing it's kind of like a if it, it, you know and, and they feed they feed each other the more you do the more inspired you. it's just i don't know it's just it's what i'm drawn to i don't know it's like it's the films i'm drawn to it's naturalism. It almost feels like non-actors. It's a lot of available light. It's all of these things, and I sort of started in that world, um, and it and that and and there's still something about that that excites me. And uh, it's just an, an aesthetic, I suppose, more than anything that I that I that, that I get drawn to. I love handheld. I love available light. I love unpredictable moments and unpredictable behavior of the lens and unpredictable uh performances i like that stuff more than absolutely 100 percent control you know and do you feel it's kind of like you know a sport in terms of like getting in the zone or like like they call, talk about it in music like in the pocket like you you're kind of improvising like in jazz you're kind of playing you're just feeling the, the other instruments and you're just kind of living in the moment and kind of just going by the, like your gut reaction, I guess. It's it. You know what? For me, you've hit the nail completely on the head. It's like it's like that is the absolute best version of what it can be. You know, I mean, 
I love shooting. I love handheld operating. You know, I like I love the work of Robbie Ryan. You know, I think his handheld work is with Andrea Arnold, especially, is absolutely impeccable. Um, you know, American Honey and Wuthering Heights. You know, just absolutely wonderful, wonderful. And it's probably in the same vein. A lot of it. You know, Robbie is not necessarily known for his craftsman like lighting. You know, which is fine as far as i'm concerned he's known for the way that he responds with his heart and eyes to a to a scene to a performance and 100 nails it you know um yeah so it's um yeah that's you know uh coming back to the musicality i love handheld i love hand i love operating handheld to the point where i have to check myself that i'm doing the right thing by the film and i'm not indulging my own desires too much you know um but i remember filming a film with ben foster and lubna azabal in um in uh, armenia called here and it was essentially a road movie in it it felt like a sort of antonioni movie from the 70s like passenger or something like that the passenger with jack nicholson and um you know there was a moment there was lots of handheld moments there was one where we were sort of in a in a in a in a hot spring and i was filming with a camera and you know people were coming up through the water and i was uh and there was another moment where i was sort of filming them handheld and and then a hand went on and they touched and they had a moment of connection and when if you film it in one take like that and you nail it and you get all the beats and as they turn you find this and you're in sync and you're dancing almost with those actors at that moment it sounds a little pretentious and i'm sorry about that but it's it, it it's in that moment where there's that connection it's the most incredible feeling and you and the director says cut and you're just like oh my you know you've got it you know and it's it's beautiful it's just such a pleasure you know uh and it, i would rather do that than um adhere to a storyboard for example you know or have it too locked because there's a there's a freedom there's just a, like you say improvised jazz music any improvised music there's a freedom and you're flying by the seat of your pants and you can suddenly get to this amazing place that you had no idea you you could get to you know? yeah it's, it's kind of like it makes me think of like uh like terence malik and like chivo what they do with like tree of life like i don't know how much was planned uh, in terms of like scripting and storyboarding but it seemed like they would just go out and try and make something happen within the frame yeah i think it's having that openness you know and and, it, and again I, it is a fine line because you, you people could interpret that as some sort of vague wishy-washy woolly kind of approach but it's not it's it's wholly dependent on everybody being in sync you know you you otherwise you're all chasing different esoteric little whimsies you know and that doesn't work you know but it's like it's about knowing the story knowing the emotion you're trying to get at that point and if the actors are bringing it and you're correctly interpreting what they're doing with your camera then it's it's you know it, it's all there you know and how important is it to you to like have the right lighting like to have the sun in the right spot or like have them positioned in a way that you know, it kind of looks like the look that you're going for. Is that something that you kind of try to communicate to, to the director? Like, this is how I want it to look. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think there's some, there's some pretty universal, obvious things to say about it, which is that, you know, um, low light is beautiful. Low, you know, most people want to shoot in low light. Um, harsh overhead midday sun especially in la as you know and other places um is a real choice you know and you can you can do that beautifully if you if somebody is being baked to within an inch of their life in the desert and that's what you're trying to say in the then of course that's when you shoot you know um if you're trying to make the desert look you know beautiful and um have a color contrast between the warmth and the cool and you know it's always going to be a less harsh image and so we you know i think most people tend to gravitate towards towards that you know and towards those times of the day but it's all about storytelling so it's like sometimes that might be completely appropriate i will always fight for it i mean and and to be fair you know directors and producers and first ad's understand that as well so for for example there were, there's a car commercial on 
that I that I mentioned to you, this Kia commercial, which is all supposed to take place at the beginning of the uh, at dawn, you know, and a, and a guy goes out and then he cleans the beach and then makes way for these turtles to come onto the beach, right? We shot it over two or three days. And of course, you know, you can't do, you know, um, you know, days of heaven or whatever it was that we only shot in the magic hour, you know, that's not going to work. So, you know, you, you, you plan it very carefully. Um, you're not really fighting anybody because everybody knows that it looks better at that time, you know. Um, uh, so what you do is you then work on the tighter shots that you're able to control in the worst part of the day. So you do the close-ups, any interior shots within the car, and then you just have to do your best to grade them to look to match everything else, you know. But if you look at that commercial frame by frame, you know, there are these longer shadows and then you cut to the rubbish being a detail of the rubbish being picked up and all the shadows are overhead, you know, they're not as long anymore. So that's an indication of that, you know, so that's all you can do, I think, really. Um, and then you manage to, you know, then you manage to make dusk, uh, sorry, uh, dusk feel like dawn, you know, which, you know, you get away with a lot more successfully, of course, certainly with the shadows, and then you have to adjust the color temperature and, and do it that way. I mean, the, the, you know, it's interesting, though, because you're like, oh, it brings up all sorts of discussions like, oh, well, the sun is right, is a, you know, the sun is only setting over the ocean or rising over there. It doesn't set and rise over the ocean. So then you're like, okay, how do you figure that one out? You know, um, you know, so I think in that instance, for example, we just committed and said, okay, you know, for these shots, these wides, we really want to see the sun. For the rest of it, we'll cheat it, you know. And, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's my approach. It's not radically different to anyone else's, I don't think. You mentioned like like filmmaking, it's all about like each crew member and like the cast all hitting like their marks and their performance at the same time. Like if one thing's off, it kind of throws everything else out. So like when you do get everyone kind of working in like succinct, like cohesive workflow and everything's happening like in terms of like your role, are you kind of looking at everything like the broad like spectrum of like is the actor like you sometimes you can feel when they're doing like for a narrative piece when they're doing something that kind of stands out and feels different like you kind of feel that like especially if you're looking through the lens and you're operating it yourself you feel like you're part of that process and like you said something just happens where you like okay that was a good take you kind of feel it i try not to lose sight of what's important and what's important is the script and the performance the lighting and the costume and the production design all of these things support the performance and the script and that and the direction the film is not about those supporting things you know um it's not a people don't go to see it purely for the costume for the lighting whatever the film will exist as probably in most instances a pretty good a resting film with good performances and good script even if the other elements aren't as strong so the reason i say that is that i think everybody and you know dps especially because you're you're trying to craft something and you're looking through the lens and you're crafting this and there is a tendency that you know oh we've got to shoot we've got to shoot and you you, you know so you got to shoot and then the actors in a moment of trying to get into their moment and you you're essentially handing over the set to the director and the and the actor of that time okay so you do two takes and you've spotted something and then you're like oh well you know okay cut and then the director will start to talk to the actor and, and suddenly you'll go in and start moving it it's so important to as much as i'm guilty of it as everybody else it's so important to try and resist it and to recognize at that moment that you've had your time and you know what what you're obsessing about is not as important as throwing the actor's game off or the director's game off. Do you know what I mean? At some point you have to just let it go. Unless it's something you can really try and, you know, it's something egregious or something's fallen down or something. Else. But I think at some point you have to go, listen, the most important thing at this moment is to get this performance and not to distract or not to fiddle on too much. Uh, you know, once you've had your time, give it up. You know? Sometimes a 
a director of photography can just be so obsessed with the image, like, oh, there's a shadow, like, I want to fix that shadow. And then that might throw off everyone else because they're like in the background tinkering and they're like the act actor might get upset, like, what the hell's that guy doing? Like, yeah. like there's famous <laughs> stories of that happening. But um, <laughs> in terms of like making it happen, like, yeah, it could be like an ego thing, like, you're like, I want it to look perfect, but it's like, it's not about you. It's about like more than just the image. I, yeah, I agree, but and I, but I, I do think most of the time it, it's it's not ego. Um, I think most of the time it's just it's such a dedication to to perfection and craft and wanting to be right. But you know, you just have to recognize when that is go when that's going to screw with everything else, you know, or something something more important. That's a very tricky, like a lot of landmines when it comes to filmmaking, like in terms of negotiating or talking or like having opinions like the director wants something and then you have a different thought like how do you navigate like those landmines in terms of upsetting the wrong people like keeping kind of um friendly but also getting your point across in terms of what you want to do i think landmines quite an explosive term <laughs> although i i probably have had a few landmine experiences in my time most of the time it's that thing where you're hopefully aligned enough to avoid those most of the time. I mean, it, it is a, a collaborative medium, but if you're in a situation where your ideas conflict with the director's ideas more than they align, then you're you're probably on, you're probably on the wrong job, or there hasn't been enough communication or understanding of what it is. You know, I, I have to say that I think a film. I think that everybody needs direction. I think actors, the director is not there for the actors or or just for the, you know, everybody needs direction. I need direction as a DP. It's not my film, right? I just, it's not. Like if I if I shoot a film uh, as a director, Brady Corbet, that I've shot three films for, you know, um, I adore working with him. Uh, I do some of my best work with him. It's not my film. It's his vision. He wrote it. He spent years. He know he could tell you far better than I can ever tell you of what the film is about, you know. And so I think I'm. I do believe I'm in the service of the film, and hopefully I understand the film well enough to tell, you know, tell the story correctly through the visual medium. Okay, um, and we and we do it together. Um, but I I don't butt heads re really too often if i if i feel that something is awry or something has gone off the rails or is not as good as it can be then yes i will i will be adamant about the way that i feel you know um or sort, or sort of unapologetic about the way i feel and i'll make my feelings known but most of the time you know i can think of times where i've suggested something or whatever and then the director has turned around and said yes but and they've argued it and i've been like Absolutely, that's fine. I just, I saw this, I saw something that might need another shot on it or something in order to aid you in the edit. If you're, if you're telling me it's not needed, then, then we just move on. But my job is often to catch things, you know, a director has a lot going on. And sometimes if you see something, I consider it my, in my sort of uh, wheelhouse to, you know, to flag it up, you know, and, uh, and raise it as a question. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I have my opinions and most of the time, as I say, if I'm on the right job, 80% of the time, the taste is the same and the ideas are the same. And, um, yeah, but I'm not, I don't, I don't have a tantrum if I, if I want to do something and, uh, and it's not, it, the director doesn't feel it's correct for the film, then you just move on. Yeah. And so in terms of like, those early on first meetings when you're kind of like feeling out the director or the process or the film or the script or the commercial or whatever job it is like are there any like red flags that kind of go up where you kind of think oh it's not going to work out and how do you like say no to like a certain project it's hard to have maybe one or two half hour hour long conversations with someone and then decide you're going to you have to just go with your gut. Do I like this person? Do I like the script? Is there enough money to do it that's not going to make it, you know, like, oh, it's a, 
it's a really ambitious project and there's not enough money to do it. You know, there are flags like that, things like that. Most time, most people are on their best behavior when you're having a phone, a conversation like this. And then you, you're in the, in the heat of it in the middle of nowhere and you're running out of time, the lights going and then people show their true colors, me included, you know, I mean, that's the real test. And, you know, and, and so maybe you'll ask other people, you know, that have shot with that director before or whatever, and you'll, you'll try and do your best to get the lay of the land and, you know, um, but you know, uh, sort of, it is an intense thing to do to make a film, and it's and and people, it's not all nicey nice, you know. And, and it's 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 a hard thing to do. It, it, uh, emotions, tempers run high, and things like that. It's okay. Like th those things for me aren't a red flag unless people are being um, just really obnoxious or unpleasant or cruel or whatever. That's not a particularly nice thing to be around, but um, I think I think for me the red flags are just you know are are we able to do this uh, in the way that I would hope it's done um, for you know for the money or whatever it is or you know it's those are the things really. Um, uh, am I going to enjoy the experience? Am I going to be at a different place at the end of having shot it? You know, am I, what am I going to learn for it? from it you know am i gonna is it gonna progress me not just career-wise but is it gonna um is it gonna allow me to s stretch myself and you know stretch new muscles and try try out new things you know like you mentioned um like word of mouth and like reputation has a a big kind of part in like be as becoming a filmmaker or a professional director or dp because everybody's going to talk like you're going to call up someone and say, Hey, what did you think about this guy? Cause I just talked to him. He seemed all right, but did he <laughs> do anything on set that kind of upset you? So I see that you're like, you have the, the BSC like in your name, like what was the process of like joining that like British society of cinematography? Like I'm sure that's to, to get into those kind of societies, you have to have like a strong like record with a lot of people like you're on your best behavior yeah if somebody says he's no good then they're not going to let you join the club i guess so we'll just talk a little bit about how what the process was like joining and like maintaining your membership okay well um i mean it's uh what was the process i mean they 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 have um pretty specific kind of guidelines um for how to join like you had to I, I don't know if it's shifted now but when i when i joined several years ago it was um it was definitely like you had to have three films under your belt and things like that and they had to be theatrical release films and things like that you know um that's probably shifted now with streaming and things like that but um you know so there's a technical a technical accomplishment you know things that you just had to have achieved irrespective of, of anything else I think um you know I, I i don't i think if you're sort of known for being um difficult in inverted commas on set i don't think there's any strike against you i think if i think if i think increasingly we probably live in a culture where if you're unpleasant and difficult to work with not only not only is it so competitive people will probably say you know what i don't really need the the headache um you know, I think maybe maybe that has changed, to be honest. I think, you know, people used to tolerate bad behavior more more than they do now, um, you know, within the industry, which I, I don't think is a bad thing. I don't really like, I don't really like people being unpleasant just for the sake of being unpleasant for their own sort of sociopathic <laughs> desires, um, you know. But um, yeah, I mean, I was very, very, um, uh, very, very lucky because uh, John de Borman was BSC was 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 uh, the president at the at the time of the BSC, um, and then Hugh Whitaker at um, Panavision, the UK was we were all at Camera Image, you know, and I think he said, "Oh, are you not BSC? You should be BSC. Let me talk to John, you know," and then we spoke, you know, he spoke to John, and then several people had to sort of you know uh, agree 
to get me into the society you kind of get voted in and things like that and um there were no black balls against my name and you know no strikes against me um yeah and then um i'm very proud i'm a very proud member of the of the society i mean i live in la now so unfortunately I, I, i'm not doing quite as much as i would like to directly support however Laurie Rose does an incredible amount, um, as as do as does everybody. You know, Chris Ross, the current president. You know, so I, I try to help out where I can, um, and it's a real honor. I mean, I had it was a dream, you know, to to leave university as a and work as a camera assistant, and then to to become a member of the the BSC is a big deal, really big deal. I'm still incredibly proud of, of being in the society take us back to like some of the early projects like that you're working on and how you kind of built like the the different connections and the different people within the industry to kind of get the next job and the next job like did you find an agent or somebody that kind of helped you along the way if i take it all the way back so basically i left university and then i knew that i wanted to be a dp and not only that I wanted to be a DP, I kind of knew I was going to be a DP. I had that real, you know, real drive and frustrated because people weren't, you know, weren't booking me, you know. Um, I mean, to shoot short films and things like that. Anyway, so basically I worked as a camera assistant. This was like from, I graduated in 97 and I shot my first film in 2006, I think it was, you know. So I managed to do it within less than 10 years, which is pretty good going. Um, you know, considering it was on 35 mil, you know, and it was a, you know, it was a, a proper film that went to Sundance and off launched my career. So, but I, I basically worked as a camera assistant. And then because I knew that I didn't have the confidence on set, I wanted to know, I wanted to be, you know, I realized early on, it's not just about what you know, it's about having the confidence to convince people of what you know, you know? So it's like when you when you're first on set. Not every we're all different. When I was first on set, I would like stand in the doorway. I'd be in someone's way. I just you were just like an idiot. Like it, you know. A case in point: at university, you have a certain confidence because you're within your peer group. Oh, I'll put the slate on. You know, okay, fifteen, take three, great, and you do it. And then suddenly you end up a professional set. And even though the simplest things, you know, how to like put a slate on, you suddenly drop the thing, you screw it up. And it's, you know, it doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. It just means you're not in a confident position to be able to do what you're doing. And I knew that I needed to, to gain that confidence. I had to be on a professional set in order to gain that confidence. And then alongside that, I would then shoot shorts and I'd always be the person that knew more than everybody else, just it, it, you know in terms of how the film should be made but in terms of experience on set you know um and then i think your question was was also about just kind of like how how you get the next gig and and get those connections so basically i i got i managed on the strength of these short films that went to festivals i managed to get an agent i think this is how it worked I, I, I was represented by an agent called Michelle Michelle Arnold in in the UK, and then I shot this film Ballast, and then it went to Sundance. I won an award for cinematography, the award that year, so it was a big deal, and the director won an award. And then at that festival, I met Rebecca Fayed, who is still my UK and European agent, and she signed me. So then I had two agents. And then I never looked back, you know, um, I just, then I was shooting and that's all I was doing. And then I was on my way, you know, and then it was just films. And then, um, you know, and then I guess the work generates the work. If the work is good, the work, gen and, and you're, you, you, you know, you, you have something to say, you can articulate your ideas and you're relatively kind of articulate and thoughtful and intelligent and um uh nice to work with and um you know good around actors and you can read the room i think that's a good thing you know if you're in a situation where you're you're effing and blinding and you know throwing things around and kicking things because you're annoyed and you're trying to shoot this delicate scene you're probably not gonna get called back you know um it, you know so it's like um 
it's a lot of things you know it's a whole combination of things to get you the next gig you know in terms of like learning like technical stuff about lighting and cameras and lenses and stuff how do you learn that stuff because you go to a university but that's obviously very short and like technology evolves are you reading like magazines or like articles or um i guess there wasn't much youtube back in the day in terms of figuring out how to do things do you have like a mentor like because the thing with DOPs, they kind of on set they're not on other people's sets unless you're like a assisting or whatever so how do you learn i just doing it i think was the process i mean i mean you know i did used to read americans i do still read american cinematographer and i used to read it you know so i'd get ideas from that but often the thing was that you didn't have the money to do any of that stuff you know so i loved i loved reading about sleepy hollow and i thought it you know the making of sleepy i thought it was incredible but i didn't have any budget to have four lifting cranes hanging huge you know diffusion sheets over entire villages and things i thought it was remarkable but i you know obviously i had no resources to do it myself you know um but i think just doing it you know um just doing it you know and, and it was a lot of uh you know, like I said, it, I worked with a director. I, I worked with two directors early on for the, the first two films that I worked with, that I shot, that were really interested in available light to the point of, of really celebrating that and taking down lights and not wanting to use lights and non actors and things like that, you know. So I learned it just through the craft of photography, like almost like documentary photography. Someone gives you a camera, film camera, go out and figure out how it works i mean the basics of, of, of photography are what matter and that hasn't essentially changed you know if you're talking about how how t-stop or f-stop affects depth of field and how depth of field affects storytelling or the focal length of the lens and how that affects the storytelling or the exposure or you know soft soft key lighting versus hard key lighting or whatever it might be you know um those things haven't radically changed you know um it's just the capture technology you know and and to be honest that stuff i have to be aware of but it doesn't excite me like i said earlier like it's it i have to know that okay people are now interested in shooting 6k or 8k or this commercial they want to shoot you know um 9 by 16 which means that you know increasingly you're used to framing like this, but then they need to do these extractions. So you have to be aware of the developments and social media thing. And you know you have you can't be blind. To, I can't pretend that I'm sort of like existing back in the good old days of you know 1950s, 60s, 70s filmmaking. I mean I'm not that much of a luddite, but it's but it's you know it's it. For me, all of that technical stuff is a means to an end, you know. And I do like, you no, know, I went to see some new anamorphic lenses just the other day, and I'm kind of excited to see what they can do. But, you know, I, I don't have my nose in all of these uh, publications as much as some people might, you know. And so when you, you talk into a director or you get the storyboards or the brief or the treatment or whatever it is that you, it's time to shoot, how do you kind of decide, all right, what kind of equipment? you need or do you just like have a grip truck with all the stuff in there in case you, you kind of think of something at the moment or if there's any specialty shots you can kind of talk about what kind of equipment you might need increasingly i i've got into the habit of kind of shot listing entire films with directors which is which has been good and maybe even like storyboarding some of the scenes that are big set pieces and i think that's probably as the ambition of the films that i've been involved in has increased you know i mean sort of technical ambition um then that's just been it's just been a necessity you know because there's a lot at stake in terms you know if if you're doing a, uh if you're shooting a film that is available light and it's non-actors and it's and it feels very naturalistic and stuff then you know you're pa you know you don't have big crane shots or big steady cam sequences or huge lighting setups and things like that but as as those things you know those um, those ambitions have increased the necessity to really plan and forward think has increased as well you know um so uh so yeah does that answer the question i feel like i've deviated but does that answer your question 
Yeah, it's just like a matter of being prepared on set. Like, so if the director asks for a certain look yeah. or something, you know, can we get the camera up in the air? It's like, we didn't talk about that. Like, how am I going to do it? <laughs> so you have to kind of find a way to make it work. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky, of course. Depends how ambitious that is. I mean, the correct the correct way to do it. Um, I mean, it's weird. I'm going to slightly contradict myself about this idea of finding stuff on the day and... Uh, but you can only do that to a certain extent, you know, like there are certain things you really just have to nail down. If, if you need the shot to be a certain shot, you've got to have a drone or you have to have, a, a, you know, a, a, an 80 foot techno crane or something like that. And you can't just have them to hand. It would be wasteful, you know, there, you know, and it, it would be a waste. You know, it, it would be irresponsible to expect that. Um, to have that at a snap of one's fingers or also to it would be irresponsible i feel to sort of ask to have it and then not use it for example you know it's not a bottomless pit a film budget even if it's even if it is you know tens upon tens of millions of dollars um it's not a bottomless pit and i i feel that i do personally take a responsibility even though i don't have a budget that i control which is unusual other departments do you know um design costume they have a budget they control i don't but i i like to cut my cloth and i don't like to waste anybody's money um and i like to be economical um so yeah i try to try to get ahead of it as much as possible in the prep to be buttoned up and to to be for me preparation is really 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 important you know and then what kind of like time frames do you get for like the feature films that uh, might vary or like a standard commercial, like a one minute commercial, how long, like, do they call you up before you have to, you know, be on set filming for one or two days and then like, what's that kind of process like? They're quite, they're quite different. I mean, coming back to what we were saying about how one prepares, the one thing that, the one thing that I sometimes find frustrating with commercials is it, they're very, storyboard dependent often you know because there's a lot of sign off from the agency from the um the client they really want to know what it is that they're, they're going to be getting at the end of the day in their 30 seconds and that's fine they're paying for it they can you know that's completely up to them but the reason it's frustrating for me is i suppose because i often um well, it's everything we spoke about, it just is a little prescriptive, you know, it's like, well, that's the shot. Okay, well, then I'm recreating that shot. Whereas for me, like, I will often try to say to a director, if it's appropriate for the for the tone of the spot, the tone of the commercial, I will say, listen, I can give you that moment. But let me let me find it in that moment. So, you know, if it's a shot of somebody taking something, and we know the feel of the piece is supposed to be quite naturalistic or whatever rather than just framing and setting up and lighting that one shot i'll be like okay get the little girl to run in she'll run in i'll be handheld oh there's the moment. and then they'll just cherry pick that little moment out but it'll feel much more naturalistic and less staged you know would be my argument you know so i so in that regard i i i you know i like to i like the storyboards to be informative rather than prescriptive um if that makes sense and coming back specifically to your point the two things are very different commercials and features in the in this in, in almost in the way that one prepares because most of the times with the, most of the time with a commercial you get the you get the, the script or the treatment you'll talk to the director you'll pick lenses you'll pick the, the stylistic approach about how it's supposed to feel you'll get the storyboards you'll all turn up most of the time you have you've know your crew but you don't know everyone else okay you're on, they've had the text they've had the director scout they've picked the locations okay here we are on the tech scout shot number one okay that's going to be here looking here da, da 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 shot two okay that's here so that's how it works and you'll have a day maybe two days depending on the size to figure that out then that'll be your tech scout and then you'll put your list together for a day or two and then you'll start shooting with a film you know, minimum you're three months on a job, you know, six weeks, let's say six weeks preparing it and then six weeks filming it, right? I wouldn't do like to do much more than five or six weeks, much less than five or six weeks prep 
to do a film. I have done it in less, much less in on occasion. Um, like, but but most of the time, I think you need that time to prepare, and so you're you're. That means you end up being much more involved in the locations and things, and and you know, um, yeah, you just have more time to explore this stuff, you know, and to explore the 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 looks and 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 to shot list the whole thing and stuff like that, you know. Uh, and then generally, you'll have maybe thirty days. I think sometimes I've shot a movie in twenty one days. Most of the time, it's around between sort of 30 or 40 days. And then other times I've shot for 86 days on a film or a TV show and had like 10 weeks prep. So um, yeah, that's how, it, that's how it works. Yeah, so like you're talking about on a commercial, if there's like a boring shot, like you wanna make it more interesting by having like a little girl running and like the, I think the thing that you can't change is like the time frame. So like, especially in commercials, it's like, you know, you've only got those 30 seconds to play with and there's gonna be like one or two second shots. So it's a matter of trying to, I guess, keep that in the back of your mind. Like you can't do like a, a one minute steady cam shot of the girl walking all the way in and jumping over. Like it would be cool to do, but, but yeah, you still have to think of the time frame, I guess. You do, but it, but it's it's not quite, Maybe I didn't. Maybe I didn't articulate it well enough. But um, so it's not that it's not that I think a shot it could be better or is boring. And oh, wouldn't it be great if we had her running in or whatever? My point is, so say it's a shot of a little girl handing something to the mum, right? And we all know it's a two-second shot. Rather than me setting up a static frame on a dolly and then a hand comes in and a hand takes it, if it's in keeping with the mood or energy of the if i've understood it correctly and it's in keeping with the 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 it's it's in keeping with the the tone of the commercial i would suggest okay the little girl rather than have her just sat there and then getting bored con constantly just handing this thing over why don't you get her running in so she's got the energy and she's coming in and then she climbs up and she hands da, da, da. and that you're still looking for the two second moment and i'm not you know so i'm not trying to expand the shot what i'm trying to do is get that moment that we catch it and i pan in with it handheld or whatever suddenly that moment feels like it's caught and it feels more i don't know just more alive to me than just something that is a little bit like staged like yeah yeah so you you think you're still thinking of the the time frame we've only got two seconds to play with how can we make this like feel more alive than just a standard like what everybody else does shot like let's make it something that's gonna like get the girl involved make her feel more interested and yeah like bring up that whole like energy level so that the the shot has something and I suppose I am talking like not everybody wants the, the commercial to feel like that but you know for example it, it sometimes it just you know if if it, if the if the commercial is leaning into that kind of verite idea or that kind of gap that kind of bridging that aesthetic between documentary and thing where you're it just feels natural and alive and has this nice kind of energy like there was a Christmas commercial I did recently that was like you know running to get presents under the tree or coming in there and everyone's supposed to be kind of like joyous and thing you know it's it, it's often really important to kind of keep that energy as well with the kids and things so if you can get them all sort of fired up and then, okay run and they do two circuits around the tree and then they come and rush over with a present for mum they're probably gonna keep that energy up better than like okay present to mum cut present to mum cut for 20 times and the kid's like I don't know what they say, you know, like it's almost like you have to kind of distract them and get them, you know, um, you know, that. So it's not just about that. If, if I think, does that make sense? Yeah, I think like, especially doing in terms of like a, a full scene, like sometimes they'll shoot like a scene to let the actors just kind of play out their roles and get used to it. It's the same kind of idea when you're doing like an insert shot or a commercial, like let's extend this shot a little bit like to get before and after, even though we're only gonna use the middle section to get that whole performance throughout, like run from 10 feet back, we're only gonna use the two feet for what you run, but at least they're in the right mood once they get there, they're puffing and they're like, here's the thing, like, so yeah. Exactly, yeah, exactly that, and it just keeps having, I mean, it's, it's interesting, like when we first spoke about 
you know, the sort of car commercials that I've ended up kind of falling into very thankfully i mean i really enjoy them but since coming to since moving to la i've ended up kind of shooting quite a number of car commercials and you can see from my work they're not you know i don't do the studio glossy lit car commercials that's not you know that's not what i do you know it's not what i chose to do i can't do everything i can do some things well i can't do some other things and it's same applies to other DPs, right? Um, what I think I can do is I end up falling into this idea of like the, the car being part of the family or the car being part of the world. Like I did this um, shot a commercial called like sort of Chevrolet through the years. And so it's like in the Second World War, a family, you know, a, kid, a guy going to war and he, his family have a Chevrolet or a kid going to college in the 80s and they have a Chevrolet. And, you know, so it's much more like, it's much, you know, everything I've said about my approach and aesthetic and, you know, things like that. It's like using that to sell the car, <laughs> it's like, you know, as opposed to as opposed to the more, uh, you know, another way of selling cars, which is to make them look incredibly sexy and glossy under under very complicated lighting scenarios, you know. Um, uh, yeah. So that's, you know, it's, um, you know, that's how I kind of got into the car commercial work you know even though you know it's almost been a kind of um an extension of the way that i've approached my narrative work you know um people have liked that aesthetic and then wanted to keep, get that tone or feeling into into their car commercial yeah and i think that's why i like about car commercials because it isn't always just about the car or the product it's about like the experience behind driving it, whether it's like for a family and they need the extra space in the car to go to the beach or wherever they do. And you can kind of take those opportunities to like build in a little story and then just have a few car shots within it. But it's like, you know, you're able to get those kind of, like you were mentioning, like those shots where you kind of like can experiment a little bit and then you can kind of take what you learned from those car commercial jobs and take it to the the feature film or whatever it is that you yeah, I mean, the good thing about commercials is you know people always say it, it is a really good way of like testing new things new lenses and things like that you know it's like it's a really good playground in that regard you know um and also meeting another thing i should say it's a great place to meet directors and people you want to collaborate with you know sometimes you know like say spike jones has a commercial and you know and they or, or say they have a film and they're looking for a dp and then they're like oh okay well i don't know if i'm ready to commit to that dp for the film but i have this commercial coming up why don't we do the commercial together and see if we like working with each other you know or whatever it might be you know a lot of you know well-known uh, directors um also shoot a lot of commercials you know so it's it, it's good it's good for good place to kind of um begin those collaborations and things like that you know it's good that it's kind of limited because you know you've only got one or two days to get it done and right like you're limited but you also like you can be creative within the constraints and whereas on a like a feature film you're still like limited but it's a li lot bigger commitment like especially if you don't like the director that you're working with or the they hired the wrong dop you kind of stuck there it's like oh whereas a commercial you know you know you've only got one or two days okay let's get it done yeah 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 no there is that for sure there's the advantages to and disadvantages to both um i mean one thing i was going to say was about the commercial like um i was going to say there's there's one on there's one on my website um uh two there's two spots for volvo which we're almost taking them to the other extreme and 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 there were these uh two directors that work under the they work for pulse films under the under the name daryl d-a-r-y-l -D and um they're, they're known for their documentary work right so volvo approached them and said hey we want to do these documentary films five minute documentary films but they're for volvo you know so then there's a Volvo in there somewhere or someone's driving, a, you know, some car moments, things. But, you know, there's a there's a five minute story that is essentially at the forefront and the and the and the Volvo is kind of relegated to the background. Right. Um, so which I thought was a kind of interesting idea. So there's one on there that's worth looking at 
which was shot anamorphically on digital called Nemo's Garden. And it, it's an incredible story about a family in Noli in northern Italy who basically are growing these um, growing ba uh, basil and herbs underneath like 100 foot off the off the coast under these kind of like domes it, underwater, you know. And so there's like amazing imagery and things like that and a great experience and to be able to tell this story. And that was essentially a kind of car commercial, if you like, you know. Um, so there are kind of really different, many different ways to do it, you know, and that's really at the other end of the spectrum, you know. Um, uh, yeah. Joke like that. Is that the agency coming up with an idea to show a short film like this? And, and where does it get shown and, and who's kind of watching these films? That's a, that's a really good question. And not, I don't know, I don't know all the answers to those questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I imagine essentially it's the client and the agency that are coming, that are coming up with it. It's just a different, you know, a different, way a different a way to essentially sell cars but it's a way of kind of giving giving a sponsorship i suppose and sort of um you know reach maybe reaching out to another audience that isn't you know maybe they you know isn't maybe maybe some people just aren't gonna buy a car based on a 30 second commercial maybe some people will watch you know will will watch uh a five minute documentary and at the end of the day it's a branded content thing and it says volvo and that's another way of reaching out to customers but it's i mean it's a it's an interesting way of doing it you know um did it go on like their youtube channel or do they put it into like short films it would definitely go out on like the youtube websites and channels and things like that yeah yeah so um but i th you know i like it because it's 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 a less obvious way of like just kind of ramming ramming a car you know <laughs> 30 seconds of like buy a car you know i i would be more inclined personally to sit down and watch a five minute documentary about people growing basil underwater you know herbs underwater and i'm like oh volvo cool all right you know volvo's cool <laughs> like you know, it's probably just different, different, different. I mean, let's not, you know, let's not make any mistake about it. I think there are all ways to try and sell a car, but I think it's, um, you know, I just think it's, you know, appeals to different customers and it's just a, a, an innovative way of, of advertising. Yeah, because a lot of like advertisers nowadays are like just, oh, let's do a 15 second commercial. Let's do like five of them in the, the one day. So it's like there's less and less long format like stuff and it's like how do you convince them to kind of do something bigger and longer format and and people kind of appreciate when they see it because they're like oh you don't get to see like this stuff very often like you normally like the 30 second super bowl type ads like people see them all the time and they're kind of like spoilt in terms of like these giant like million dollar commercials that nobody really even pays attention to like they see it and they kind of tune off like oh another commercial it's a that it's like a and also i mean i don't need to mean to be entirely cynical about it i mean you know, there may be somebody at um you know any of these companies volvo etc that is like you know what we we think it's important for these stories to be told you know and we have money to be able to do it and you know it's like it's like any you know it's like anybody uh sponsoring anything you know and uh, you know an art form or uh, you know um whatever it might be you know there's many different um it's not always a cynical marketing exercise you know some of some of it might be have alt altruistic intentions you know and things like that you know so um i mean one thing is like gr when i was growing up commercials were definitely they definitely smelt they def <laughs> definitely felt sorry they definitely felt more i, I don't want to say innovative but they were kind of really extraordinary commercials being made um and kind of bold funny courageous odd strange commercials that i don't think Jonathan glazer's commercials and things were always kind of like really you know i mean the guinness commercials the sort of levi's commercials um oh i mean you know like i don't know if you ever saw this do you ever see this french commercial for um uh wind power did you ever see this one 
it's a, it's wonderful it's like really clever it's this very unusual looking man french guy very tall um sort of long-limbed just an, un, an an unusual looking actor right and he was almost play, playing like a mime artist um he has sort of like dressed in like long tight fitting black uh clothing with a like a bowler hat right and he's talking and he's saying how basically everybody in the world hates him right and he's saying and he's running around and he's saying i have no friends i just upset people whatever. and he, so there's somebody on a park bench reading a newspaper right and he goes out he sits down next to them like this and then he just starts hitting the newspaper as the guy's trying to read it and he's hitting it he's hitting it and the guy's like with his paper and he's hitting it and the guy gets upset and he walks off and the guy looks really dejected because he's done it again uh, there's a woman walking down some steps he goes up and he just like lifts her skirt and she gets really you know and he tries to brush it down and he gets it and then like he goes something else someone else doing something else he just hits it hits the bottom of this thing and they go everywhere and, uh, and you're thinking well, this is really strange and then he starts to talk about then he re he starts to talk oh you know like uh he meets somebody i don't i think it might be a little girl with a windmill or something like that and he blows on it there and you realize he's the wind you know and to everybody else he's just annoyed them you know like he turns like an umbrella inside out or you know and then finally he you know he be he becomes useful to somebody you know and it's amazing it's just like brilliant commercial you know really simple idea you know i just thought that was a that's a terrific example of just like a really clever smart commercial. yeah i just found it's called miss the wind commercial yeah uh, it's yeah. wonderful it's really, it's really, wonderful. really wonderful. he must be wearing some kind of mask or something it's kind of strange but yeah like no i think that might be him <laughs> <laughs> but yeah those kind of commercials yeah like a lot of like good creative, I guess the creative directors come up with those kind of things. And, and there was like a lot of risks, I guess, getting taken. And, and nowadays, I guess everybody's kind of scared, like job security, they don't want to take any risks. They want to do what it's going to sell, like in their market research has shown to kind of sell the car. So they'll sit down like 20 people and ask them questions and, and they don't want to deviate from the script so much as this is what's going to sell it and this is what we're going to do yeah i guess so i mean i don't want to you know i don't yeah i get i guess i guess i guess that's what it is you know yeah don't want to upset any creatives <laughs> yeah well that's the kind of stuff that i like cut out like if oh yeah fuck them that's like well, well, i'm happy to go on record for everything everything i've said i just i don't know i'm not i'm not you know i'm lucky enough to shoot these things uh and enjoy shooting them i just don't yeah i don't know that it's you know being it would be very interesting for you to talk to you know somebody behind these things of what the process is of how things get decided or how they're shot you know because you know, i think you're right i think i've shot a lot of like commercials and 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 they're that you know it's it's not a it's not a controversial thing to say that there is a certain formula often to how these things are uh you know how these how these things are put together you know yeah i've tried i've been trying to find like producers and creative directors and like um, advertising agencies like a lot of them don't want to talk for whatever reason but i just got to keep keep finding keep, keep asking i think they think that i don't know what they think but we can speculate yeah yeah for whatever reason they, they don't want to talk about it but for D dps and directors most of them they fine it doesn't work in the industry anymore and there's, but has worked in it recently enough to perhaps that's why they don't work in it anymore i don't know but find somebody yeah, especially the ones that were working like 50 years ago or whatever i want to sure. find some of those guys like what was it like we'll see yeah, whole different uh, world then i think none of them have websites or anything though so it's like hard to find yeah yeah i think that's it's just enjoy talking about like the process and other people's like experiences and in terms of like finding different ways of doing something and and where things could go wrong so in terms of like for yourself throughout your career 
like have you watched other people like kind of make mistakes and then have you made your own mistakes where you kind of learned a valuable lesson and thought okay i'm not going to do that again or i'm going to steer clear from doing that i think i think it's very easy to get seduced into things sometimes to believe what you're being told as opposed to looking taking a step back and looking at like maybe the budget the sensibility of the people involved and then thinking you know what with all the best intentions i don't think it's gonna be that in the end you know if that makes sense so it's like sometimes you can have these ideas and about how you ultimately think something might end up and either the budget restraints or just the maybe a disconnect between the creative vision you know of what you think it could be oh this could be this could oh my god this is amazing this is going to be this and then you're like oh yeah it's never actually going to be that is it you know and and, and i think most of the time if you actually look carefully at how something is going to be marketed or sold or whatever it might be often you can um you know you could probably take a step back and uh and look at it and think is is this going to be is this going to be the film that I hope it will be? Yeah, because it's like early on, you mentioned like you're there to kind of service the director's vision. And the same with like a like a commercial, if it's for like a company and these creatives sometimes been working on it for months or even years and they already have like this strong like vision for it and they want it to be a certain way and then you kind of come in and you want to, change things up like you could easily upset some people but it's like a matter of doing it in a way that's kind of like adding to the process rather than taking anything away from them so are there times where you've kind of like had an idea and then been like i guess wary or like kind of inserted your vision in terms of like trying not to upset people like how do you kind of go about that kind of thing i mean i think i think you're sort of I think you have to recognize what commercials, how commercials differ from films in many regards. Um, it's not the same. It's not that you care less. I'm not saying that, but your level of creative investment is different because it's not, you're not being asked the London, set of the same thing 1874. necessarily. Like it's, Keep your wits about you. you know, like I say, this city it, often vast, the storyboards have all been decided. And and, you know, so and you're, it's a much tighter constraint that you're working you with. And you're not, you're not being asked to you sort of like well, blow it up and change it and do something you. radically different. You, you know, you're, are you're asked to, um, in the best way you possibly can. And of course you're being asked to add to it. Creative, you are, and such you're being asked to work within a tighter remit than, say, Don't a feature film. Me. I mean, a feature film, you get the script with the director, Welcome and if you click, this Pass could be anything. But the one wow, we're just I mean, this thing I feel like this. Sugar. And, this oh, what about if we do this? And, oh, my God, I hadn't even thought that that could be. Yeah, let's like do Why don't we shoot that like that? Better than you do now. Like, the, you know, all the bets well, are off, really. Least, many, I, I would like you to move it's to rare Chester that, Villas. in my experience, that there have been films. I mean, Sugar, I have to say, well, like the Chevrolet through the years, you know, I've got, 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 got very excited about shooting it. actually on 16mm yes, and some like that. And own. that was fully oh, embraced, and that was really cool. That was really cool. We I really felt that th those decisions kind of elevated what it was. Like not supposed to um, interfere in your and, you know, that was, so that was great. And then are there any like commercials that you would want to like talk about? Like it was a Volkswagen uh, Arteon um, commercial and it, it was this kind of monster truck commercial that I didn't shoot all of it. I just shot the, the, the monster truck elements and it was essentially kind of like it was a director, uh, Dante uh, Dante Ariola, that I that, that that I worked with. We shot in Minnesota in this big stadium where they were doing a monster truck rally, you know. And um, you couldn't once the monster trucks they're kind of unpredictable, you know, big bouncy tires, and they kind of, you know, see, so you, you know, they would easily bounce the wrong way and bounce on you, and that would be a, a very bad thing. So there was like, so you couldn't really be in there. You had to work with remote cameras and stuff, and that was good in that we just got a load of like GoPros and we just rigged them onto, and we we set them specifically so that they look more filmic and closer. We were into cutting them with, you know, like 
it would, probably would have been an Alexa or something like that, you know. Um, uh, and that was good, you know, just just take being able to take these little cameras and rig them, and then just you know, we ended up putting ND filters on them so that um, it, it it forced the depth of field to be shallow and things like that. And then we changed the shutter settings so they weren't so smooth motion and things. You know, and that was pretty cool. Um, just just doing things like that where we could just rig all these different GoPros and then send the trucks off. And I suppose I, I mentioned it because it was just one of those things where you uh, um, sort of necessity is the mother of invention in some ways, you know. It's like, what do you do when you, you can't get in there? And so we just were forced to do a different, you know, come up with a different way of doing it, you know. Yeah, no, it looks good with like the you see the when it lands, like the amount of like shock. Like, but that's the kind of thing like you can't really fake. Like you couldn't just do that on a green screen, like him like hitting his head like that. That on other things, and you you end up building a gimbal for the for the car um, and things like that. You know, because um, often you'll work with an actor. Like I did a Brie, a Brie Larson commercial. You know. Uh, for for Nissan and uh, you know you have you have to do a green screen because you can't put her in a car and it jumps around and does all these kind of like de potentially dangerous things you know but you'll tend to have a rig and then they jibby the rig so that it kind of like you know drops and then and then oh, and then you know as it, you know so you, there are ways of kind of doing it but you know you're right it's the, there's uh it's always best to try and do these things in camera I think if you can. Yes, especially if they're professional guys that are doing it, you can, yeah, if you couldn't get an actor in there to do a big jump, I'm sure that the insurance wouldn't cover it. Exactly, exactly. But, um, yeah, so in terms of, like, shooting commercials versus shooting, like, feature films, I'm sure, like, the time frames are a lot different in terms of, like, um, like a commercial is like one or two days maybe and, and then a few days travel like a week at a time and then um, mm. like a feature film is sometimes you're away for months at a time is that kind of the way that those things go yeah yeah I mean I mean there are exceptions like the Chevrolet job was you know in Utah and stuff for weeks or weeks on end it was wonderful but um, you know I think the older I get, the less I want to be away all the time as well. Like I, you know, I used to shoot more films back to back and, but I was away in Budapest for three months earlier this year. I'd be quite happy to sort of do a film every one or two years. I don't really have a desire to do two or three films a year. I mean, that's a lot. And so that's like you're being away from your family and your home and you're kind of living out of a hotel i guess in terms of, yeah listen if the right if the right jobs come in i'm not going to say no but i'm not going to really go out of my way to try and spend nine months of my year away from my home yeah because i think when you're first starting off like film school like the goal is to do like a feature film but it's only until you realize like what that entails like especially when you grow older you're like oh geez i gotta be away for months at a time yeah. It's, it's a big commitment. So I think like commercials are a good way to kind of get that both best of both worlds. And so in terms of like you, you're able to work on a film set, but it's not for, you know, a year you can kind of get in and out and yeah. So what, what are you thinking for like the future in terms of like more, more projects that you want to film? Like what, what do you want to do when, like as, as the future comes, like what do you want to achieve? What what are some of your goals? I don't have a desire. I don't have a desire. I suppose there is a. I suppose there is um, a perception, or even maybe an ambition of some people to like. The bigger the production goes, the better. You know, that's the obvious conclusion. I'll start small, and then I'll end up doing, you know, a two hundred million dollar Marvel movie, and that is, that's progression. You know, I don't necessarily think it i don't uh, you know i don't subscribe to that um i suppose i obviously want to carry on shooting films and i generally would prefer to shoot films i prefer the process of shooting films over television um i love at the moment that i have a wonderful balance between commercial work that i do 
and then means I can be selective with the films that I choose to do, you know. It hasn't changed radically for me. I just want to be able to shoot. Um, I want the holy grail that everybody wants, which is to be able to shoot intelligent movies that are not dumb, lowest common denominator movies, but they, they say something interesting, have an unusual take on what it is to exist, uh, you know, as a human, and they have some something to say in that regard. And they've got enough of a budget to say it and for me to do my job and for me to, you know, survive on um, and live my life uh, and pay my, pay my mortgage. Um, and, uh, you know, with actors of a certain caliber and with a director and a team that I'm collaborating with of a, of a certain caliber as well, you know, and it's like, that's fine for me, you know, um, that's, doesn't have to be hundreds of millions of dollars. It becomes increasingly difficult the lower the budget comes if it's in the in the half a million, one, two million dollar budget range. It's harder to work in that world. Not impossible, but it just it just is harder for very much, you know, for many reasons. I just want to keep doing what I love doing, you know, which is work, working in this industry with people I enjoy working with um helping to tell stories that i think are important to tell like you said if you work on a 200 million dollar budget film i'm sure there's a whole committee of people scrutinizing every little thing that's happening so there's probably less room for like that creative like vision i think that's true to an extent but you know like i don't know how much killer you know um killers of the flower moon cost for example right but um i know enough to know that um, there's not a lot of hands in the, there's not a lot of hands in the, you know, there's, there's not a lot of messing around. If you do that movie, you know who's in control of that movie, you know? Um, so, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you, you know, if you're gonna fund that movie, you know what you're getting into and, uh, you know, you, you better let those people make that movie. Yeah, because I think that was like an Apple film. You could I watched it last night. It's like Apple production. It's like, but it's Martin Scorsese, so it's like he has like a certain amount of power to do what he wants. And it seems like these streaming platforms, they probably don't have the same kind of controlling executives as the the studios used to have back in the day in terms of like having their little I think, they, I think they could i think they just cho choose not to i think it's a different model you know i mean um you know i've been very lucky to shoot for netflix for example you know and um you know look at films like roma or white noise that i shot for noah and um you know uh the irish room for example they're all examples of um ota led movies that um that Netflix has, has backed, you know, and they backed them and they let them make the movie that they wanted to make, you know, and I'm all power to them. And I'm very grateful for that. You know, um, that's how it felt yeah, when they, I was involved in it. And I think that's, you get the, the film that the director wanted to make. Yeah. Cause I know they do multi film deals like with Adam Sandler or whatever, like we want 12 films over 10 years or whatever, but I just Googled killer of the flower moon, 200, Two hundred million dollar budget. So it's right on. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So it's um, you know, it's uh, there are plenty of movies like that that I'm sure are made by committee for the very reasons that you've that you've outlined. You know, and they, you know, they probably are in the more, you know, in the in in in, in the more traditional studio mode or the the bigger sort of um, you know, um, you know summer release movies you know the i'm sure if the the studio had their way or the the marketers or whoever the money men the bean counters would have said like cut it off two hours more explosions more killing like they would have had their way with it you know i think some of those movies i i i enjoy as well you know but they're not they're not the you know, I mean, I think there's just a certain economics that kind of comes into play. And the longer the movie, the less screenings you can have per night and stuff like that. And I get it. I'm not, you know, it, it is what it is. You know, it's a, there are many different ways to make a movie. 
and many different reasons for making a movie you know some are artistic expression some are you know box office or a combination of the two you know it's a you know it's a business it's an industry at the end of the day it's got to it really has to try and make its money back i think uh maybe don't get too comfortable um don't get too complacent keep keep your edge keep uh you know i think if you get too comfortable and you have too many too few sleepless nights you lose your edge a little bit you've got to always be a little nervous is gonna you know keep you on your game you know i think it's important and try not to let ego get in the way um you know and uh yeah, I think that kind of keeps you on the, you know, try not to try not to get seduced from the path and whatever that path is that you decide you want to be on. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's easy to get easy to get swayed and then suddenly be like, oh, I'm not sure, you know, you know, it's not sure this is the road I should be on. Well, yes, yeah, thanks so much, Lal, for talking to us. Um, as just like a final thought for somebody who's looking into becoming like a director of photography, like specifically for commercials or feature films and like, how can they go about like getting to the next level? What kind of advice can you give them as just like a, a final thought? Um, you mean sort of at any, early on in the in your career, whether you're coming out of film school or not, or just wanting to break in? Yeah, it could be somebody who's been like doing it for 10 years. It could be somebody who's just starting out. Like what is some kind of just general advice in terms of like how to get to the next level? Like do you call people? Do you keep making like um, your own personal projects? Like, you know, I think if you want to do your own personal projects, then that's, you know, I don't think that's a way of, um necessarily making money or that's a very personal thing um to, to want to do i think what i've probably learned recently in sort of the, because of the current climate and stuff with strikes and things is really just keeping keeping relationships going you know i've reached out to people that i haven't worked with in a while and then it's got me it's got me some really nice jobs you know and i think it's also that thing about you get a little comfortable and stuff, you know, and you expect the, you know, the work to sort of, you know, land at your feet. And I think it's about, you know, keep keeping those relationships and keeping those people that you enjoy working with, keeping them close, you know, and maintaining those relationships. Yes, yeah, so I, I think a big part of like being a filmmaker is those relationships because you know it, you can't really do it all on your own. Like you need to kind of communicate with others and like build that network of people around you. So what about like some advice for people who are just trying to figure it out? Like how do you meet people? How do you reach out to somebody and like send them an email? Or Like how do you kind of uh, start that initial kind of friendship? Uh, I think it's probably got a lot easier than it used to in terms of like pe people's information being out there, certainly social media and just being able to find stuff on online and things like that. Um, I mean, I always say to people, you know, you know, I'll get people being in touch, getting in touch and being like, oh, I, you know, I'm a fan of your work. I'm just starting out, you know, and I'll, I'll give them as much help as I can advice. Um, it's hard to sort of bring them onto set, I have to say. Um, but if I can, then I will. Um, but I just say, I always say like, listen, just, keep in touch and if somebody says to you keep in touch exploit that as much as you can you know you don't have to like make yourself be a, you know, it'd have to be a pain about it but you know i'm like you know call them every month you know i'll, I'll say to them like just check in check in every month I, i've asked you to i've told you you should so just do it you know and if i don't hear from me it's because i'm busy trying to do my thing but like just keep you know Take somebody at their word. If they if they if they open the door, you know, put your foot in it and make sure that you know it doesn't. You know what I mean? It's like um, don't be a shrinking violet about it. Don't make yourself a a pain and harass them. But at the same time, you know, don't don't be shy in asking for stuff. You know, most of the time people are very 
that one that most of the time people have been in that position themselves they also are quite happy to talk about themselves and what they do because they love doing it and they want to give something back and offer some advice you know that's how i feel I'm sure other people don't but i think most people probably do cool yeah because i think you know if you want to do something you kind of have to ask for it like a lot of people are scared to ask yeah but you're yeah, not okay. going to get anywhere unless you try so, yeah all right so cool. keep, keep in touch I will, I'll, I'll keep my foot on the door or in the door. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.